Our course is called Making Things, Three Million Years of Materials and Culture. And one of the things we focus on through the entire period of the course is social learning and how social learning has played such an important role in how we as humans learn how to make all the different kinds of things that we make. Social learning is part of our hominid heritage. It's part of our primate heritage. It's been the primary way that we exchange information and learn how to do things, how to make things, for the entire time that our species and our close ancestors have been on the planet. When we look at other kinds of learning that we do, learning from writing, learning from reading, for example, those have only been here for about 5,000 years. They are not part of our neurological hard wiring. But when we look at social learning, gathering together in small groups, sharing information, learning by observation, learning by what, seeing what other people are doing, that has been the primary way, the main way that we have learned to do things for two million years, three million years. It is part of how our brains are neurologically wired. So if we're going to teach a course about materials and technology and the social context of those, what better way to do that than by introducing social learning, learning in small groups of peers with your peers. I really enjoyed the social learning aspects of this course. It was uh, fun to work with people. I'm very extroverted, so I enjoy working with others and being able to collaborate on work and uh, see other people's ideas was very interesting and helpful. This course evolved from a course that was developed by the Materials Research Society uh, by Kevin Jones at University of Florida, uh, where they created Impact of Materials on Society. Uh, we took that course and made it more of a materials and archaeology course, but we owe them an awful lot for developing the initial modules that we've been adding on to ever since. So we're very, very grateful to all the hard work that they've done in the past. So the social learning experience in this class is probably one of the most unique aspects of this course because it literally mirrors how humans have developed over time. Humans are social creatures. We did not, you know, evolve from, you know, hand axes to the iPhone on our own. And that same kind of experience is mirrored in this classroom, being put in a social environment to have that kind of synergy of ideas to craft something new and innovative. Operational chains are the sequence of steps, the instructions for making something, for turning some group of raw materials into some piece of finished technology. And those operational chains began all the way back two million years ago when Homo habilis, the first member of our genus, began knocking cobbles around um, in Eastern Africa, uh, making their cobble tool technology. From those very simple operational chains, of making stone choppers out of cobbles. We get things like smartphones and computers today. It's all part of the same process of, of technology continuing to descend through time from those original operational chains. In our course, Making Things, uh, we teach materials from all the way back starting in the Stone Age. And we built this course into about 13, 14 modules where we cover the Stone Age, then we cover the age of glass and clay, and then we finally cover the age of bronze, the Iron Age, we cover concrete, and many other modern materials because a lot of modern materials have followed the same kinds of operational chains that we understand from uh, earlier times. So on Wednesdays, after learning so much amazing information about the materials behind the things we use, we turn to look at the archaeology, the history of our interaction with those materials. On our Wednesday lectures, we take each of the materials that we've discussed on Monday from the engineering material science side, whether it's clay, glass, copper, bronze, iron, steel, carbon, concrete, gold. And we look at each of those through the prism of history and through the long durée. Archaeology side of materials because materials are interesting to me which is why I signed up for this major but it's cool seeing another perspective and seeing how materials were used in the past and how they shaped our past. So each Monday I was lucky enough to get to teach material science to a huge diversity of students. 
We have students in this course who come from not only history, sociology, anthropology, but students in the engineering school, in physics, biology. But in addition to that, we had students from the School of Business, from kinesiology, uh, even from the pharmacy school. So we had a very broad range of experience. Well, I would say that being able to interact with other students that are from so many different backgrounds was really great, especially with this poster project. Just hearing people's different ideas, um, combining, sure, the technical aspects of design, uh, but also just the creativity uh, is a lot of fun. And for the Flipped Friday classroom activity for the writing materials module, we took e had each of our groups, um, five to six people in a group, go to the Kelsey Museum of, um, of Archaeology here on the University of Michigan campus. And as part of their visit to the museum, each group was to find some aspect of writing and the writing process that they could create a small group poster around. So some artifact in the Kelsey, it could be the kinds of stylus that, um, that Romans used or Mesopotamians used. It could be papyrus. It could be a carved, uh, carved coffin lid with hieroglyphics showing the Book of the Dead. All of those kinds of things are available for people to look at there in the Kelsey. And so each group of students went on their own outside of class and not only found something to use for their poster, but also explored the museum itself and learned much more than just the one little thing we wanted them to learn for class. And in the context of doing that, we could see how much fun they were having seeing the museum, seeing these different artifacts, doing it together in a group. That whole group aspect is so important because that's where social learning happens. And so they're doing that social learning, not just here in the classroom, around a table um, on Friday activities, but they're doing it outside of class now in the museum. One of the most fun things we did this term was a project where the students had to design a component of a superhero costume. They could invent their own superhero, but the superhero had to come from one of the modules that we studied in our class. So someone from the Age of Clay, or someone from the Stone Age, or someone from the Bronze Age, etc. And they had so much fun with this. They had to identify uh, the expected modes of failure, how would they make it, and how much would it cost. But of course, they could only use technologies that were available in those ages, and they could only use currencies that were available at those ages as well. But they came up, one group did Alloy Man, where they took Otzi, a Copper Age uh, mummy that they found, and they turned him into this mythical creature. There was Nizak, a Bronze Age Egyptian, there who used meteoric iron embedded into his uh, stone. The Bronze Buccaneer. There was also uh, Clayface and the Carburizer, who could shoot high-pressure carbon and iron to make steel. Then Nick, the, uh, the arsenic absorber, who kept people from dying when they made arsenic bronze. And finally, Captain Lightning, who had a little switch to turn his metallic suit from a low melting temperature material to a high melting temperature material. Attendance for Friday small group participation was mandatory. And so the students came in for the Friday activity having already prepared for what the activity was that day. Their homework prepared them for it, and then the activity itself was designed around that week's module so that they could look at it from a slightly different perspective than just regurgitating what we had talked about in the Monday material science lecture or in the Wednesday archaeology lecture. The problem was something that they would be facing themselves as a group, how to, how to resolve the problem. How would they do this if they were faced with a bottleneck, if they were faced with a broken link in their operational chain for a particular kind of material. And so their homework prepared them for that, their reading prepared them for that, and they could come in and engage in the social learning for the Friday activity. But overall, when people were here, they participated and it really um, makes for fluid conversation and an exchange of ideas and discussion and I think that that is more beneficial than a traditional classroom where you stand or rather the professor stands and lectures and the students are too busy writing that they don't actually get to process and digest the information and actually participate in learning. So in this class we didn't have any exams but we still needed to find a way to assess 
what the students learned. Every module had outcomes set at the very beginning that we tagged our, all of our activities around. We had outcomes that were more focused on the material science, and we had other set of outcomes that were focused on uh, the archaeology. So what we did was tw two times in the term, we asked the students to look at all the outcomes, and for each module they had to choose one materials outcome and one social science outcome that they thought really was important to them. Then they did a self-assessment as to whether or not they mastered that outcome. And by mastery, we gave, we explained what we meant. They had to give themselves a zero, one, or two. Or they could give a three. A two is an A. A three is if they wrote a paper on the topic and got it published. But, you know, we want to acknowledge that because they could have. Then they had to provide evidence in their self-assessment to us that they actually did deserve the score they gave themselves. They turned that in by writing a reflection on each of these. The reflection, the reflective part was providing us with the evidence, and the evidence could come from their notes that they took when they were reading. It could come from the homework activity they did. It could come from one of the projects they did. We don't really care. Then we looked at it, and if we agreed with them, they got full credit. On the other hand, if they felt that they really didn't achieve mastery, they could give themselves a one and supply a plan to achieve mastery within the next week, and they could submit it in the next week. So if they said that they got a two, an A, and we didn't agree with them, they would get marked down and no chance to improve. But if they were honest and gave themselves a one, we were usually very generous in our grading. And that's how we did our self-assessment and reflection. I felt like the group like, like projects and like the self-assessments were like really good because I feel like the material we, we learned it would be like kind of difficult to like put it in like a normal exam form. So I think like the way you did assess us really worked for the class. One of the secret weapons in this course was our use of instructional aids. Instructional aides at the University of Michigan are undergrads who come in the classroom and assist us in teaching. We used our instructional aides to make sure that everybody was included on Fridays in the discussion. Uh, I think that the IAs played a, a big role in just having these discussions move forward and also just having someone who you, know, you can consult with uh, some topics that you might not know. And I think that was a, a big benefit of having both archaeological students and uh, material science students as IAs. So. so we talked a lot in this course about casting molten metals. This is how the early Bronze Age got started. This is how the Iron Age got started, making furnaces and pouring hot metal into molds to make you know, weapons, to make farm implements, to make jewelry. And we thought, wouldn't it be fun if we could give our students an experience of pouring metal? So we did. We brought the students over to the material science and engineering department. And we have a facility where students can put on protective clothing, put on protective headgear, gloves, and then pour molten aluminum into a mold. To make it more Bronze Age-like, we just used a simple sand mold where we took a block M and pushed it into the sand, creating a mold, and poured hot aluminum on top of it. And the aluminum solidified, and then we were able to quench it, uh, scrub it up a little bit, and everybody got to bring a block M home with them as a souvenir. Rather than just listening to lectures over the course of a semester, trying to memorize, trying to cram it all into their brain, regurgitate it in an exam, and walking away and going to the next class. They now have a set of experiences. They met people. They talked with people they didn't know before from different backgrounds, different educational interests. They talked together. They worked out problems together. They made posters together. They came up with Clayface together or Lightning Man together. And when you do that, you learn, and you retain that learning.